Hello. Well, <clears throat> I'm here today to talk about what is regarded as the greatest film of all time by so many people. Um, and like some of the various other films I have talked about in this many months, I don't think there's too much I can say that hasn't already been said about this film. Same like with the Godfather trilogy, or uh, even when I did a new uh, sort of a, a revision or revisiting or whatever of Scarface, whatever you want to call that second video where I try to give a bit different perspective on that, um, I think I can only do something similar with this film. And this film is obviously Citizen Kane, you know, the greatest film of all time. And, um, you know, people have talked about this so much. Um, the film is, you know, very similar to the story of William Randolph Hearst, though I've seen some people say it's more of a, like a parody, you know. And there's various elements of Orson Welles's life incorporated into uh, the film, you know, such as the Charles Foster Kane losing like his uh, parents at an early age, you know, them, you know, uh, that didn't happen to Hearst. Um, that happened to Orson Welles, and a good. And someone, I watched the documentary of the Battle of Citizen Kane, which actually comes with this version. Um, uh, here, and it's the DVD. It's the Blu ray. And actually, in here is the. Uh, somewhere. Is. The back of. I have it in here because, well, the used to just stick on the back because kind of for this one it was kind of flimsy and everything was kind of wasn't all that strong so I just kind of took it kind of folded it up a little bit and just put that in here but you know this is the 70th anniversary um, next year this film will be 80 years old um, but you know you know there's you know, how it's like, you know, there's quite a bit of this film that is very, m reflects Orson Welles, either early in, in his life or, I guess, to a degree, predicted some of what would happen later in his life. Certain things of this character kind of paralleled himself in a way, which I think is quite interesting. Um, um, and I'll probably also get into the whole script thing a bit a little later but how I just want to kind of give my perspective of uh, this film um, like when I really hit my radar when I finally saw it um, when I was like in my pre-teens or 13 like between 11 to 13 I would say I heard about this movie um, called the greatest film of all time and so, you know, around that time, I was really getting more and more into movies. Um, just beyond Star Wars, Batman, and all that stuff, you know. I was also getting quite a bit into horror films. I had already been a big fan of, like, universal horror films. But as I was getting older, I was more interested. And in also, looking back at some of those other films, like perhaps around the universal monster film era, just interested in watching some of these movies and also other classic films too. You know, and I did see many of them um, uh, a little later in life, if I, if not necessarily around that time. But you know, this was one of those films I heard of quite a bit. You know, mentioned as the greatest film of all time. Um, I also wasn't too interested in the film because one of the things I heard was 
quite political and stuff. And it's like, you know, around that age, you're not really interested in politics. At least most people of that age, you know, 11 to 13, if you heard about something like this, probably not much interested in politics a whole lot. Now, as I've said, I, I've always enjoyed the Star Wars prequels. I think because I was such a big fan of the original trilogy as a kid, and I was also a kid when the prequels were coming out, you know, and the politics of those films didn't really bother me much. I did find them interesting, even though I didn't really understand what was going on, but it was, it, as the films progressed, it did make sense why the politics were in there. Um, though, of course, my later in my teens, like mid to late teens, I finally saw Citizen Kane, and you no, know, there's really, you know, not much politics in it. I mean, the character does run for governor and isn't successful, um, which is reminiscent of what happened to Hearst. Runs for political office and can't get in. Basically, he tried to buy his way in because, you know, it's like, you know, money can buy anything, really, but, you know, he realizes it can't buy everything that you want. So, you know, there is that element to it, but, you know, when I finally saw it, you know, I really enjoyed it, and I saw, I've, I saw other films of Orson Welles prior, um, A Touch of Evil was a very notable one of his I first saw, um, at least one that I saw that I really recall seeing, you know, it's quite possible I saw some others that I recent that I rewatched later on, um, I really enjoyed, um, though, Chimes at Midnight, um, I believe that's the correct <laughs> title, I know there's a couple titles that film is called, but Chimes at Midnight, um, it's said to be his best work, or, um, though I haven't actually seen that, though I've read the premise, and it seems like some other films, to a degree, of that I have seen, but I think that also has to do with that film was quite influential, sort of like how many of the films that Wills has made were influential, Citizen Kane being quite prominent. It's one of the most parodied and cited films to be, you know, have some sort of tribute or have some sort of big influence or impact made to certain uh, people and uh, filmmakers uh, and within their films. Uh, and many people say it's their favorite film of all time, though I think for a good number of those people, they say that because it's regarded as the greatest film of all time, so they just kind of say that. And perhaps some of the and perhaps they're completely genuine, but others, I, I'm sure it's like, it's just the cliche. It's the greatest film of all time, and here's my perspective as to why that is. You know, some are very good, well-rounded, interesting points. Others, not so much, but I think when you hear some people saying that, you can really weed out which one's are completely genuine who think this is the greatest film of all time and others who don't. Really, but just kind of go along with it because they don't really, they're not sure if they have an actual favorite movie. I've already lit, named mine. <clears throat> so, and I've given my reasons why I enjoy that film. But I do enjoy this film quite a bit. Um has an interesting history of how this came to, uh, to be anyway. I think that's also kind of a more interesting thing to talk about because, I mean, yeah, that, that's that been talked about before too, but I think it's an interesting story because everything that has been said about this film, about what the contents of it, can really, has already been said, so it's like I'd be regurgitating all of that. 
but my perspective was when I first heard about it, not interested. But as I got more into films, got curious, finally watched it, and I enjoyed it. Realized there was not much to do with politics. I mean, there is political stuff there, but it isn't as huge and prominent as I thought. Um, maybe that was because that was one of the main things I really heard when uh, it was first brought to my attention. Like the po political stuff, I'm like, oh, I'm, not, I'm not interested in that. Um, obviously, you know, I have my political leanings like everybody, but, you know, I do think I'm not that interested in politics still when it comes to consuming films and stuff. I'm not interested in things like identity politics because often, to, uh, especially nowadays when that's incorporated with films, a lot of times that's going to be age really bad. Like if you rewatch a film like that has such like identity politics within five to ten years later, it doesn't age well. It's not good. It's like it's very dated. Um, though this film doesn't have that, so which I think also helps. That's one that really helps preserve the film and remember it as fondly as it is. Um, I think with this film, uh, uh, there was also an, a stigma Hollywood and the industry had against Orson Welles. One thing is, uh, he got this contract for of, that was really unheard of for somebody who had never made a single film in their entire life. Because Orson Welles, up until he made this film, was primarily a stage actor. If he directed anything, it was on the stage. Um, so that's as most of his directing would go. And he also was in radio. Uh, obviously, World of the Worlds, that broadcast, is very well known and famous possibly infamous, particularly of that time, 1938, when it happened. But, you know, people tuned in uh, and had no clue that, you know, this was a radio broadcast because they didn't come in uh, when they would say this is like a, they're just doing a radio play of War of the Worlds and sort of have a, you know, disclaimer. They didn't come in on that part, so what they were coming in on was basically Martians from Mars coming and attacking and destroying uh, 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 people in various places, so, you know, that's just caused quite a bit of a you know, caused some controversy, though, that did get people's attention towards Orson Welles. And he, uh, um, and from that, he got this deal where he was able to have complete creative control of the film. Basically, he was able to write whatever he wanted. He also got Final Cut, which again was completely unheard of for somebody like. Wells, who just uh, came to Hollywood, and apparently he really had no actual interest in Hollywood. He wanted nothing to do with it, and he actually made these requests, or I guess, depending on who you talk to or who you would be, you might think these were demands, not requests, but he had these like conditions of, he had approval of the script of how it turned out, he had final cut, do all of this and that, basically the studio would butt out and have no say over what would happen, and that was completely unheard of for somebody who just is now being basically thrown into Hollywood, whether they want to or not. He made these requests, demands, whatever, and 
they just said, yes, sure, you know. They wanted to have Orson Welles. They wanted to have this man who everyone's talking about because, you know, RKO, which has released this film, they wanted to have him uh, make a movie because uh, whatever he made, you know, because of what happened with War of the Worlds, people would, you know, very likely be interested in the film. And so he got what he asked for, and so the, this is the film that came of it. He did try a couple ideas for films. Obviously Heart of Darkness is his most well known that he didn't get off the ground. Which became Apocalypse Now. Decades later, a, a different adaptation of that film, um, set in the Vietnam War. But, you know, Heart of Darkness is what he wanted to do, but budget and various other things made it so that couldn't happen. So, he had this idea, which at that time was called American, or The American, and, uh, Together with Herman Mankiewicz, they wrote Citizen Kane. Uh, Mankiewicz would be off somewhere and had to be babysat, as Wells <laughs> puts it in an interview I heard. I heard of him where he was babysat and he because uh, he had a drinking problem, so. Somebody was there to make sure he would be able to focus and write the script. So he wrote various drafts, and Orson Welles wrote various drafts too. Orson Welles also had a secretary, and the secretary made sure to date all the scripts that he had, and they were organized and put somewhere. And when Orson Welles got all of Mankiewicz's uh, script scripts he looked at them and he looked at his own and from there he combined the best elements of both scripts and then thus citizen Kane um, and there's this whole notion that because of the contract that Orson Wills had he begged uh, Mankiewicz to have no credit whatsoever uh, though I think with Horace and Wells and what is known about him regarding the films he has made, you know, not just what, what he was in as an actor and didn't have any other input in behind the scenes, but was just the actor, he would, as the shooting and everything would go on, he would at some point incorporate his own vision, his own thoughts into the script, regardless if he was the initial writer or not. He would at least be co-writer, if not the sole writer. So, even if he didn't initially write the film or had any part of writing it, which, though, history and what you can find online and from various interviews and discussions of the, of this topic... It's very clear Orson Welles did write the script for Citizen Kane. After writing various drafts and getting the drafts from Mankiewicz, he took various elements from both, basically the best of both men's various scripts, and then combined it into one final draft into what was Citizen Kane be authored by both of them. Um, and it's an interesting, it's just interesting how that's just became a big controversial thing. But Mankiewicz and Wells both hated Hollywood, but Mankiewicz was more into Hollywood. He knew more of the ends than Wells did. He, well, like Wells was more known about on the stage and radio. He was new to film. And a lot of the camera movements and stuff that you see that people are like, that's so innovative and, you know, 
even though they, it's been said that, you know, some of the stuff that they said was like invented or brand new for Citizen Kane, actually similar movements of the camera were in other films, but, you know, it's just certain movements in the way things are framed in Citizen Kane. It's like a lot of things combined and uh, presented in the film hadn't been done like that, like all together. So different things with the camera and other technical that are seen as technical innovations happened to Citizen Kane because of, well, it's the, uh, you know, he was new and the director of photography just let him do whatever. He was happy because he was, he, one of the appealing things for him was he had, he never made a film and this was going to be an interesting experience and he wanted to have that experience with, uh, with Orson Welles in making the film. But I think because of the deal that uh, Orson Welles had, as well as the later negative publicity from Hearst of hearing about the film and then making sure not one single ad or review would ever be in any of the papers he owned, because he owned so many across the country, it was like, you know, Orson Welles' film was kind of in jeopardy as a result, and, you know, it's unfortunate, but that's how powerful he was. And then because of this, also the industry sort of had a backlash against Welles, especially since the movie was very well received by people who saw it. And it's like this guy made this film for the first time ever, and it's fantastic, it's an amazing movie and as a result there's a resentment towards him because of it and so like at the Academy Awards got nominated for nine Oscars and only won one for best screenplay uh, so you know Orson Welles is an Academy Award winner I've heard many say he is not an Academy Award winner because he did not win best actor or director or the film best picture but he is, because he wrote the movie with Mankiewicz. Um, though many say the only reason it's likely that the film only won the Oscar that it received is because of Mankiewicz. And it's more like a tribute to, you know, Mankiewicz and his various contributions in, in the industry. And Orson Welles just happened to also be the co-writer of the film, so... He is also honored, even though at the Academy Awards they they booed every single time Citizen Kane's name was ever mentioned as a nominee. Um, as time goes on, this is seen as a superior and better film than How Green Is My Valley, which won Best Picture. And that isn't a bad film, but if you're going to compare that film to or uh, Citizen Kane, I think it's clear Citizen Kane is better. Um, I think most people would at least say that. He lost to Gary Cooper. Um, Wales did for Best Actor for uh, Sergeant York. Which, you know, that's a fantastic film. So I can understand his loss there, though. I think I've talked about, you know, tying for films and how certain times, like for acting in particular certain films should have ties for the acting categories and I think that's an instance where there's a tie there or so well as at the very least should have tied like with uh, Gary Cooper and then there's also the fact that you know the Maltese Falcon came out one of the best film noir uh, movies of all time that came out in 1941 also um, but I don't know, I guess a three-way tie, though, I don't know. It would be hard. Though I do think Orson Welles deserved Best Actor, though, if he was to tie, and you could only have two people be the recipients for a tie and not have a three-way tie, I guess you would tie with either Humphrey Bogart or Gary Cooper. Um, I can't 
can't really choose between those two to tie for Wills, but, you know, that's just my own thoughts on it. Um, but really, this film is a fantastic movie. I definitely understand why it's praised the way it is, though. I wouldn't say it's the greatest film of all time, but there are people who generally think that, and if you are one of those people, that's fantastic, that's great, that's awesome. Um, I do think Star Wars is the best of all, film of all time. I've given my reasons before. Um, I don't want to repeat them here because that'd be a bit redundant. But, you know, Citizen Kane is a masterpiece. It's well deserving of the praise it has gotten, as far as I'm concerned. Though, the title of the greatest film of all time, I don't know if it's truly that deserving. Though, that's also not to say, oh, Star Wars is deserving of that title. That's always subjective. That's, you know, whatever one's favorite movie is, that's likely what people will probably say is, at least in their opinion, the best film of all time, and they can give reasons. Um... But Citizen Kane is definitely fantastic. If you've never seen it, um, I would suggest to give it a watch. You know, at least once. See if you like it. If you do, cool. And if you don't, that's fine too. Um, you know, um, I can see how this wouldn't appeal to everybody. But I don't think this is a bad film. Um, so, uh... With that, um, I will leave you to it. Uh, I hope you all will have a uh, great day, a great weekend, and a great week. See you all next time, and uh, thank you for watching.